polymers. We've all heard of polymers. Polymers are large molecules made up of small repeating units. The repeating units are called monomers. So mono means one, poly means many. So a polymer is many monomers stuck together. And examples of these are polyethylene, polypropylene, polyester, polystyrene. These are, um, you know, synthetic fabrics and plastics are all pretty much polymers. You can't write an exact formula for a polymer because the polymer is created by joining a whole bunch of these monomers together and it's, it's really kind of pointless to try to make them all the same length. So if you make polyester, some of the molecules are going to have more monomer units than others. And so we don't have a specific um, formula. The way we write the formula is we put whatever the repeating unit is inside of parentheses and we just write an N on the outside because the N is going to vary. But this shows us what that repeating monomer unit is. So we're not going to see, you know, C453H5 zillion or anything like that. This is how we write formulas for polymers. So alkenes form polymers and substituted alkenes form polymers. Addition polymers are ones where the monomers simply add together. And you don't make any other products. It's just like taking a bunch of beads and stringing them together. You don't get extra stuff left over or anything. They just add together. So addition polymers, um, it's a little bit like the addition reactions, except that the only reactants are the monomers. So here's the formation of polyethylene. So this is ethylene. That's the common name. It's the IUPAC name is ethene. But this is ethene. And so ethene adds across another ethene and across another ethene. And what we end up with is this long chain. Now that looks like an alkane, doesn't it? The product there. It is an alkane. But it's polyethylene because it's made up of ethylene units that are joined together. The double bonds go away when, when we make the polymer. And these generally require some sort of a catalyst. So how would we write the formula for that guy? I don't really have much room here. Well, the unit is this CH. That's the part that's repeating. And then it's got an N on the outside. So it's that unit repeating. If we look at down in here, here we've got one unit, and there's another, and here's another, and they're all stringing together. This is polyethylene. We also make um, addition polymers from substituted from substituted ethenes. So here's polyethylene, and its line angle formula is just a zigzag line. And here's the space filling model. That's units of of ethylene joined together. Polypropylene, this is a substituted ethylene. It's got this methyl group. And so we see the methyl groups showing up. And so this is going to be bulkier and have these little methyl groups hanging off of it. Polyvinyl chloride is where we take vinyl chloride and string those together. And so you end up with that. And that's this is PVC. So if you've ever done sprinkler work or anything, those white PVC pipes, that's what they're made out of, polyvinyl chloride. So the general idea for these um, substituted alkenes is, or ethylenes, here you have ethylene and it's got some substi substituent on it. It's substituted. That could be a methyl group, an ethyl group, it could be fluorine, it could be... Um, this benzene ring here, 
And so when, when you make this chain, you've got that substituent on every other carbon. So here's polyethylene, here's polypropylene, that's made from propylene, and so we've got this CH3 methyl group on every other carbon. This is vinyl chloride, so we're going to have a chlorine, every other one. This is Teflon. Teflon is made from tetrafluoroethylene. So each carbon is going to have two fluorines on it. And this is polystyrene. And these are things, these, chem, these polymers are used in stuff you have around your house. Uh, polyethylene's in bottles and bags and toys. Um, polypropylene is in, um, in heart valves and indoor-outdoor carpeting. It's a little weird to think that the same stuff that's in indoor-outdoor carpeting could be used in someone's heart. Um, plastic wrap and, and bags and garden hoses, um, cooking utensils. Uh, Teflon is that non-stick coating on the inside of your frying pan. Polystyrene is that styrofoam packaging. So used in lots and lots of different things. These ethene-based polymers um, are very unreactive, which is great when you're making a product that you want to, to stick around. Like, you know, these bottles. I think these bottles are made out of... These are, these are polyethylene, these water bottles. And you like this to be non-reactive so that it'll last a long time. So it's great for durability, but then in terms of disposing of it, you throw it in a landfill, it doesn't react with anything, and it's just going to sit there basically forever. So recycling uh, these polymers is pretty important, and it, it's very doable. The properties of these ethene-based polymers depend on three different things. The specific monomer, you know, whether you're doing vinyl chloride or ethylene or, poly or styrene, and it also depends on the length of the polymer molecules. If all your polymer molecules are pretty short or very long, the properties of that polymer are going to be different. And it also depends on the extent of polymer branching. Some of them will branch and some of them remain straight chains. And so just as an example of how those um, properties or how those factors affect the properties, we can look at the three common forms of polyethylene. High density polyethylene is what you find in the plastic grocery bags. And those are relatively flimsy, right? But not as flimsy as those dry cleaning bags. You pick up your clothes at the dry cleaners and it's almost this filmy plastic on there, which keeps the dust off and keeps your clothes clean, but wouldn't be good for carrying home a bag of apples or anything. That's low-density polyethylene. And then there's linear low-density polyethylene, and that's what's used in the nicer shopping bags that you get, like if you go to Macy's or someplace. You go to the mall, and they give you a nice shopping bag, and those are much sturdier. And so they're all polyethylene, but some of them are very, very flimsy, and some of them are much sturdier. So those are ethene or ethylene polymers. There are also butadiene addition polymers, and this involves butadiene. So 1,3-butadiene, when this polymerizes, we get polybutadiene. And some of these are um, substituted. This, this guy is isoprene, 2-methyl-1,3-butadiene. And when we polymerize that, we get polyisoprene. This is um, what natural rubber is, is polyisoprene. Now, these polymers are not saturated. They have a double bond, and so they're going to tend to be a little more reactive, and they're going to probably decompose a little bit more than the other ones. Then there are also copolymers. An addition copolymer is where you have two different kinds of monomers that are present. So saran wrap is a copolymer, and here's, here it shows us what it is. This is vinyl chloride and 1,1-dichloroethene. One, one 
and when this polymerizes, these alternate, and we end up with two different iso uh, sorry, two different monomers in this chain, and that's going to give it a diff different sort of properties. Another example of a copolymer is styrene butadiene, I'm sorry, butadiene rubber. This is the uh, most common synthetic rubber. So this is uh, a big component of car tires. And that involves 1,3-butadiene and styrene being put together in a 1 to 3 ratio, or 3 to 1 ratio. So some of them, like, like the saran wrap, are 1 to 1, but it doesn't have to be a 1 to 1 ratio. I'm not going to quiz you on what the two monomers in saran wrap are, but I want you to have an idea of what a copolymer is and what an addition polymer is. So a copolymer has two different kinds of monomers. A regular addition polymer just has one type of monomer, and they're just strung together like beads on a bracelet. Here is a summary of the chemical reactions of alkenes that we've talked about. So this, um, these sorts of diagrams are helpful for pulling everything together because we're going to need to know the chemical properties of these different types of, of compounds. So this, this is a summary of the alkene reactions. We've got combustion, so you get carbon dioxide and water. We've got addition, and we've got addition of symmetrical molecules, hydrogenation and halogenation. We've got addition of small unsymmetrical molecules, hydrohalogenation and hydration. And here, they're writing this out in sort of a generic form. You could take any compound that has a double bond. What's bonded to these carbons here could be anything. It could be alkyl groups, it could be hydrogens, it could be fluorine, it could be anything. So it's just saying, here's the double bond, that's the functional group, that's where the action is taking place. And what happens is this guy adds across that, and you end up with this. Now, we have not talked about how to name alcohols, so we're not going to worry about that. But both of these being asymmetrical or unsymmetrical, we have to consider Markovnikov's rule to predict the more predominant structure. So that's kind of your summary.